Please take your seats and we'll, we'll get started on the session, uh, Bringing Prevention and Early Detection to the Public, uh, Global Perspective. We have uh, four speakers and I think it's a really interesting and, uh, and um, sort of convergent uh, uh, different approaches to the same topic. I'm going to lead off by talking about global trends in cancer and the uh, imperative for prevention. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose, and I won't be talking about uh, off-label use. So there's two parts to the talk. One, I'm going to talk about uh, the topic, the overview of global trends, and then I'm going to talk about examples of cancer prevention in economically developing countries. This will complement the other three talks, which talk about uh, uh, cancer prevention interventions in uh, wealthy countries. So the main... I'm going to start off with what are some of the major features of, glo of the global trends? And, and the first and um, most obvious is that the number of cancer cases and deaths is increasing very rapidly worldwide, and it's increasing disproportionately in economically developing countries. So this shows uh, both uh, historic and projected annual number of new cancer cases per year, and you can see that by 2030, the um, uh, number of uh, expected cancer cases will be um, uh, more than three times what it was in 1975 and just about more than twice what it is uh, in 2010. And there is also this profound shift in the burden proportionately from developed to developing countries. So the, the reddish uh, section of these pie graphs just show how this uh, uh, continues to progress such that by 2030, about two-thirds of all cancer cases will be in low- and medium-resource countries. And the, what is happening in cancer obviously parallels what's happening in other chronic diseases. This uh, graph from uh, Global Burden of Disease shows that the, the increase in uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, deaths from non-communicable diseases from 1990 to 2030, and what you see is that the cancer is actually a smaller increase than cardiovascular disease is taken collectively, uh, but larger than the other causes uh, shown here. So th this is the huge um, uh, epidemiologic transition that's occurring uh, throughout um, the low and middle resource countries. And the, and the two or the three factors that, that are causing this increase to uh, disproportionately affect developing countries, the most important are the demographic factors, that uh, these countries have very large populations of young people, and uh, the extension of lifespan and, and better longevity is allowing pe more people to reach the ages where cancer becomes common. So this uh, kind of complicated diagram on the left shows the um, age structure of uh, men and women in low and medium resource countries in, uh, in 2000, the blue, and what is projected for 2050 in, in the orange. And what you see uh, with respect to the uh, economically developing countries is this very broad base of young people, um, you know, predominantly under age 20. Um, and what you see in the red is that with the aging of these populations, you will have far greater absolute numbers of people uh, age 50 and above when cancers become common. In contrast to the high resource countries on the right where aging is going on, but there's not the, the huge population of younger people to, to amplify it. So the two other reasons why the increase is disproportionately affecting developing countries is that there is this slower decline in the major cancers related to infection, that is liver, cervix, and stomach in the economically developing countries than in the high resource countries. And uh, as you know, there's this entrenchment of modifiable risk factors, smoking, obesity, physical inactivity worldwide. And, and paradoxically, we have now making progress against smoking in the rich countries, whereas um, uh, going backwards in the poor countries. So where we are um, today is that the two most populous countries in the world are contributing over 40% of new cancer cases. You can see that China is uh, contributing an estimated 30% and India uh, 12%. And in economically developing countries, 
the, because of these factors, the mix of cancer sites that predominate it continues to change. So this just shows the 10 most common incident cancers according to level of economic development of the countries. So on the left, in the more developed countries, as you would expect, breast, prostate, lung, and colorectum are the uh, most common cancers. When you look at the less developed countries, historically, the infection-related cancers, uh, cervix, stomach, liver, would have been at the top, but already breast and lung cancer have passed them, and prostate and colorectum are, are moving up. So I've been talking entirely about absolute numbers of cases, which is, of course, what determines the public health burden. But what about trends in incidence and death rates? And as you know, there are favorable trends in death rates in many high-resource countries. So I'm going to show you a series of slides for different uh, parts of Europe and other uh, wealthy countries. And you can see that in northern Europe, this is uh, Scandinavia, um, Finland, and, and the UK, the, uh, there is a decrease in the death rates from all cancers combined um, uh, that is larger in men than in women. It varies among countries. And I actually could spend a whole talk just talking about uh, what's happening among these countries. So this is central and southern Europe. And you can see, again, that uh, the rates are, are uh, 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 lower and uh, the, the, uh, the decrease is greater in men than women, but is present in both. And uh, this is the, uh, the US, Canada, Australia, and then, and then uh, three others, Korea, Japan, and the Russian Federation. And in all of them, surprisingly, the death rates are, are decreasing. The very high rates are the Russian Federation in men, and uh, the US uh, is close to the top in women. So despite this decrease in death rates um, all across uh, the Western countries, incidence rates continue to increase in nearly all of them. So this shows the incident trends in the incidence rate of all cancers combined in uh, the Scandinavian countries in Finland. And you, you see the increase in, in both men and women. And uh, you see the same thing in, uh, in France, Ireland, Great Britain, and the Netherlands. Whereas um, when you come to other countries, there's sort of mixed trends. Uh, the, the US, these rates are, are standardized to the world distribution, so they look a little different from, um, from what you see standardized to the US population. But, uh, but there has been a de decrease in incidence rates from all cancers combined over the last um, uh, five or seven years in the US, um, but mostly uh, at best, the rates are flat. And when you look for uh, data on trends in incidence or death rates in low and middle resource countries, um, you, th there really aren't the comparable data to show. So to summarize the global trends, in, in high resource countries, we have this encouraging decrease in cancer death rates. We have incidence rates continuing to increase or having a mixed pattern. And we have this uh, progressive increase in the number of cases, whereas in economically developing countries, we have little historical data on trends in incidence and death rates at the national level. And we have this massive increase in the number of cases for the reasons I showed. So I want to change to the second part of my talk, which is uh, several vignettes about uh, uh, in preventive interventions in uh, economically developing countries. and the. Uh, uh, the, the rickety bridge that connects uh, the very large amount we now know about the modifiable causes of cancer with the actual implementation of effective cancer prevention programs. And I'm going to, so I'm going to uh, talk quickly about uh, tobacco control contrasting Vietnam and China and giving you a bit of a global sense. And uh, talk about infection related cancers uh, limiting my comments to uh, liver cancer and hepatitis B because although cervical cancer is vaccine preventable as well, the, the vaccine isn't affordable in, mo in the high-risk countries, and so it's a much more complicated story. So here's the uh, global goal in tobacco control, somehow pulling ourselves out of this pile of cigarettes. And globally, in terms of the sale of cigarettes, 
the picture is dismal. Uh, there's just this progressive increase in, in, uh, in global sales. It, it, this shows billions of sticks up to, actually it shows it to the early, early 2009. And it's just uh, getting progressively worse. And in terms of the map of smoking prevalence among adult men, um, we have the very high smoking prevalence in uh, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union and among men in China. And then for women, the color scheme here is a little uh, deceptive, but it is the robin's egg, the lighter blue color that uh, are the countries with the highest rates. So it's North America, much of Western Europe, Australia, and, and part of uh, South America. Now there is some good news in global tobacco control. And the first part is that reductions in smoking in many Western countries has caused a downturn in smoking-related cancers among men. And so this first slide shows the uh, downward trend in lung cancer death rates in the US, the UK, and some Commonwealth countries. And uh, the decrease in the UK among men began earlier and is larger in an absolute sense than any other country except Finland. The decrease in the United States, uh, notably, uh, accounts for four, about 40% of the decrease in all cancer death rates. So among men, the decrease in lung cancer death rate, which resulted from education and um, middle-aged educated smokers quitting, um, accounts for about 40% of the progress we've made in reducing all cancer death rates. But you can actually see that uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, are ahead of us. Um, Central Europe uh, shows this kind of intermediate pattern, but I want to switch to Southern Europe where the tobacco epidemic has lagged that in Northern Europe and, 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 the, and the states um, by, by about 15 years. And you can see that even there among men in Italy, the lung cancer death rate is decreasing. Um, whereas in Greece and Spain, it's only uh, leveled off. And of course, among women in um, all of the Western countries, the best that has happened is that the death rate has leveled off, not decreased. Well, the other good news in global tobacco control is that several countries have been exceptionally successful because of strong leadership at the national level and governmental action. And they've been especially effective in influencing governmental action. So, as I said, I want to contrast uh, tobacco control in Thailand with what's going on in China. Now, back in uh, the mid-1980s, the tobacco control community in Thailand began low-intensity educational campaigns. And then, six years later, by 1992, uh, they had national legislation passed that outlined a broad tobacco control plan that includes all the ingredients that, that tobacco control people are familiar with, clean air laws, warning labels on packs, frequent and regular tax increases, and marketing restrictions. What I want to emphasize about each of these elements is that there has been incremental progression uh, with, as social norms change, <clears throat> uh, a tightening up uh, uh, um, of the intensity of the measure. So for clean air laws, <clears throat> when the law first passed, the bans were just in public transportation and elevators. And then in 1998, <clears throat> they extended to air-conditioned workplaces, the place where you want to be in Thailand. And in 2002, the ban was extended to restaurants and shopping areas. Similarly, <clears throat> with respect to uh, warning labels, in 1992, uh, it was mandated they cover a third of the package, and it was text. 1998, half the package, and then 2005, these uh, gruesome uh, pictorial warnings that you see here covering half the package. And with respect to frequent and regular tax increases, they've had six of them. And the estimate um, by Ron Levy's uh, Sim Smoke um, model is that it is the tax increases that contributed over 60% to the reduction in smoking prevalence in, in Thailand, which is a 25% reduction. So basically without tax increases, you, nothing else works. But tax increases alone are not, are not effective. You have to have the clean air laws, the media, the health warnings, the marketing ban, etc., 
to change social norms and, um, and to build public support for tax increases. So I want to contrast that with what's going on in China, where the government owns the tobacco industry <clears throat> because of the size of China. You have 300 million smokers, 57% of men, and still low in women, although that is the, uh, the huge question, will, women, uh, will young women begin to smoke? You have already a very large number of smoking-related deaths in China, expected to increase to 2 million a year by 2020. And you have smoking-related illnesses already accounting for 10% of Chinese health expenditures. But here's the problem. The part of the government that runs the uh, tobacco industry <laughs> brings in $14 billion a year in profits. And the Ministry of Health, which is in charge of tobacco control, receives $3 million a year for tobacco control efforts. So you have really a, a more than 4,000-fold difference that is uh, impossible to overcome. And furthermore, the degree to which uh, cigarettes are embedded now in Chinese culture is perhaps even greater than was the case in the US back in the 1940s and 50s. This is a primary school that is funded by, uh, by tobacco sales. And that sign there, translated, says, ingenuity is the fruit of diligence. Tobacco will help you succeed. So it's, 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 it's really uh, shocking. And cigarettes are viewed very positively in Chinese culture. This is a modified uh, picture of a man uh, giving a gift of a carton of cigarettes. And what they have done in modifying it is to paste a picture of diseased lungs uh, on, on, on the front of the package. Uh, trying to, to uh, the importance of what it takes to change these social norms and attitudes about smoking and cigarettes. So to go quickly to infection-related cancers and control strategies for liver cancer, as, uh, was, uh, as Jerome Groupman discussed, liver hepatocellular cancer remains a major killer in parts of Africa and Asia. It's number five for incidents, number three for deaths. And chronic infection with hepatitis B accounts for about half of all liver cancers. He also showed this map that showed the global prevalence of chronic infection with hepatitis B and the high prevalence areas being in China and adjoining countries, sub-Saharan Africa and a belt across the South America and then other populations. Now, in terms of universal hepatitis B vaccination, which is the goal globally, the vaccine is effective, it's readily available, and in absolute terms, it's inexpensive, 20 cents a dose. And the regimen is that the first dose has to be given in the first 24 hours after birth in order, order to prevent the vertical transmission of infection from the, an infected mother to a baby. And then the two subsequent doses get given at one in six months. And this schedule, if it's met, is over 70% effective at preventing this vertical transmission. Now, the challenges in terms of prevention um, that uh, Jerome Groupman mentioned are, were the sustainability of infrastructure to deliver this vaccine, and particularly in, in Africa and Western China, and particularly in poor parts of, of those regions. And this whole issue of timeliness, which is particularly uh, important in China, where vertical transmission is a, a major route. Uh, it, the challenge is administering the first dose within 24 hours and then completing the three doses early in childhood. In China, you have 60% of the population has a history of having been or being infected with HBV. Just under 10% are chronically infected, and it's over 260,000 HBV-related deaths, both liver cancer and cirrhosis annually. And what is new here is this issue of, of timely delivery um, in different parts of a huge country like China. So that you see in the uh, highly populated belt on the east, the uh, over 80% of, 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 of the first vaccinations are given in the first 24 hours. And uh, almost 95% of, of the babies receive the three-dose vaccination coverage. Whereas um, in the intermediate section of China, uh, you have something intermediate, and, and in this huge western part of China, uh, it's under 50% of babies who get vaccinated within the first 24 hours, and it's less than 70 who complete the coverage. And the reason why this happens is that a lot of births in this area occur at home, 
And so giving the first um, dose within the first 24 hours is a real challenge. So I'm going to make time for the other speakers. Um, just to summarize, what we know about the causes of cancer is far ahead of our ability to develop, develop effective interventions. We need prevent, better preventive interventions if we're going to sustain and accelerate the progress that's being made in wealthy countries and to slow the uh, huge increase that's occurring in the number of cases in low and middle resource countries. And a few lessons that I think you will hear echoed in the talks that follow, that cancer prevention is really a long-term process. It, it, it proceeds through incremental steps and you have to be in there for the long term to have it uh, succeed. That education is an essential element, but it isn't sufficient. It was education that accounted for um, adult smokers quitting in, in many Western countries and accounts for the, the lung cancer decrease we're seeing now, but it clearly hasn't been sufficient to um, uh, uh, reduce smoking in, in many of the poor parts of the populations. And the, that in fact, effective interventions usually involve modifying the social, economic, and physical environment, which is a much bigger thing than a single change. And Notably, to achieve this, um, what needs to be done is usually outside the direct control of scientific researchers. And yet, research on these interventions, their effectiveness, and how to improve them is critical to motivate and inform uh, this process. Thank you.